dismayed Whatever tied God will take care of you Beneath his wings of love abide God will take care of you God will take care of you Through every day or all You're very welcome to our online service. We're going to just begin this morning by singing the song, The Goodness of God.
Good morning. Thank you for joining me as we come around God's Word this morning. We're in the book of Acts, and today we're looking at Acts chapter 18 from verse 23 through to verse 28. I've entitled my message this morning, A Growing Follower of Christ. We need to be growing followers of Christ. Jesus desires all of us to grow in Him daily as we walk with Him. And the good news is we can grow as followers of Jesus. I read this week of some people who were asked to give wisdom from their years of experience and what they've learned as they've grown as a human being. And I love the responses that the youngest and then the oldest people gave. The youngest little boy was six years old and he said, I've learned that you can't hide broccoli in a glass of milk. And then an 82-year-old lady said, even when I have pains, I've learned not to be a pain. A lady of 892 said, I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. Growth is good, friends, and it is especially true for spiritual growth. God wants us to grow in our walk with Him. In Thessalonians, uh, the Second Thessalonians 1 Verse 3, Paul is writing to the church and he says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. This was a church that was growing in Jesus in every single way, and we should be growing as believers. God wants us to grow. And today our text gives us four keys that we can use if we want to be a growing follower of Christ. And the first thing that it speaks about is if you want to be a growing follower of Christ, you need to be available. We need to be available. We also need to be available to help others. In verse 23, we read of Paul he went over all the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. The churches in Phrygia and Galatia needed help, and Paul was available to strengthen them. This was the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. Paul gives moral and spiritual support to those churches because they needed it, and he was available. He was encouraging those new believers and building them up in their faith. Are you available, like Paul was available, available to meet the needs of others? Then we read also from verse 26 to, from verse 24 to verse 26, that Apollos was also available. Let's continue our reading. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord and he had taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, 
he knew only about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. Apollos had a lot going for him. He was a great speaker. He was an expert in the Old Testament, and he was committed and he was courageous. But actually, he wasn't a saved. He wasn't a true follower of Christ. He only knew of John's baptism. The knowledge of John's baptism and preaching had spread extensively in the world at that time. They expected the Messiah to come. Many of them knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't know that he had died on the cross for them and risen from the grave. So some of them were just waiting for this Messiah. John's ministry doctrine had circulated with great success from synagogue to synagogue in the surrounding nations. John had preached repentance and he baptized. He had even baptized Jesus and acknowledged who Jesus was. And he often spoke of the one to come after him, who we know is Jesus. And Apollos had embraced that teaching. You can cross-reference that with Acts 19, verse 4. Apollos instructed people in the way of the Lord through the teaching of John the Baptist. He taught repentance and readiness for the coming Messiah. And although he might have realized that Jesus was the Messiah, he had not heard of the death, the resurrection, ascension of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. He taught what he had known up to that point, and he did it reliably. Apollos probably only knew what John the Baptist knew when John had died. In spite of all his gifts and knowledge, Apollos hadn't heard the full gospel and he needed the most important message of all. And Aquila and Priscilla are available to share this message with Apollos. Aquila and Priscilla, they take Apollos aside. They are available to spend time with him and show him the way. And I love the way it says they discreetly took him aside. They didn't shout out while he was preaching. That's nonsense. They discreetly took this young man aside. Look, uh, Priscilla and Aquila had helped Paul in Corinth. They had been with him, and now they go and they help Apollos as well. We read in verse 27, Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia, and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who by God's grace had believed. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. So it's amazing. You see Paul's availability. You see the availability of Priscilla and Aquila. And as soon as Apollos has heard the full message of the gospel, he's available. He wants to go to Achaia. We all need a bit of help in life, but there are many times that we need to be that help for other people. Are we available to do that? God wants to use us. Are we making ourselves available to God? A growing Christian is always someone who is available to God. You might think, what can little old me do? But our God likes to use little things to make a great big difference in the world. Max Licardo wrote this, and I'll read it to you. The guy who gave Jesus the donkey on Palm Sunday is just one of a long line of folks who gave little things to a big God. Scripture has quite a gallery of donkey givers. We read of so many people who we just take for granted in Scripture, but God used them in a powerful way to fulfill his purposes. Think of the widow's might. Think of the little boy whose lunch fed over 5,000 people. God uses little things to make a big difference in this world. Are you willing for God to use you? Are you available? God can use us if 
we are available. And in order for us to grow as followers of Christ, we need to be available. The second thing we need to be is teachable. Apollos had learned more about God's word than most people had, and he probably knew a lot more than most people did. Verse 24 says that he was mighty in the scriptures, and that's quite a uh, quite a compliment. It means he was powerful and strong in God's word. The Greek word actually means dynamite. So he was dynamite in the scriptures. Notice, although he knows the scripture so well, he is teachable. He has this amazing quality. Apollos didn't know the thing that he needed to know the most. And that was the good news about Jesus. He didn't know that Jesus had died and risen from the dead and what could be his Lord and Savior. And Aquila and Priscilla, they take him aside and they explain to him the way of God more accurately. And Apollos is teachable. God wants us to be teachable. Apollos embraced that truth as he heard the truth of Jesus. We're never too old to learn. We should always be willing to learn. And God wants us to be growing in our spiritual relationship with him. In 1 Peter 2 verse 1 to 3, Peter says, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all kinds of unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Be teachable, friends. Be teachable from anyone. I've had to learn from my children over the years, and I thank God that he's put them in my life, that they could teach me different things. God wants us to have a teachable spirit. We can never get to that point where we think we know it all. We never know so much that we can't learn more. So how do I foster a teachable heart? Well, one of the ways, and you see it in the life of Apollos, was his desire to get into Scripture. It says he became mighty in Scripture. Why? Because he was consistently in God's Word. And if we want to grow in our spiritual walk, we need to be in God's Word consistently. And we need to have a teachable spirit as we read God's word. Not only just gloss over the things that we don't want to read, but to intently allow God to speak into our hearts as we read his word. This is a process. It's a process for all of us. It takes time to grow in our walk with the Lord. Rick Warren wrote this. There are no shortcuts to maturity. It takes years for us to grow to adulthood. And it takes a full season for fruit to mature and ripen. The same is true for the fruit of the Spirit. The development of Christ-like character cannot be rushed. Spiritual growth, like physical growth, takes time. When you try to ripen fruit quickly, it loses its flavor. We've got to be willing to grow. We're not going to become mighty in the Scriptures overnight. We need to be willing to consistently be teachable. And over time, we will grow in God. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You never know so much that you can't learn more. And the thing that you learn today or tomorrow may be one of the most important things that you ever learn. So be open to learn something new for Apollos. That was the most important thing he had ever learned. He found out that Jesus had died. He had been resurrected. He had forgiven our sins. And he was taught about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Apollos could have been there and stubbornly refused to listen. He could have said, you know, what if he said to them, what do you tent makers know? What are you trying to teach me about God's word? I know a thousand times more than you'd ever know. 
And many people are like that. They know it all, but Apollos wasn't. He had an open heart. He was teachable. And we need to be teachable if we want to grow as followers of Jesus. And then the third thing we need to be is we need to be dependable. Again, in verse 27, we read that after Priscilla and Aquila had shared the gospel with Apollos, he desired to go to Achaia. And what happens? The Bible says the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Why did they decide to write, to exhort the disciples to receive him? Well, the Christians in Ephesus were happy to write a letter to exhort the people in Achaia to receive him because they trusted Apollos. He was dependable and trustworthy. And I tell you, God is looking for dependable and trustworthy followers of Jesus. That's how we grow as a follower of Jesus, when we are dependable and when we are trustworthy. Wayne Field wrote this. He said, I wonder what would happen if we applied the same standards of loyalty to our Christian activities that we expect from other areas of our lives. If your car starts once every three tries, is it dependable? If the postman skipped delivery every Monday and Thursday, is he trustworthy and dependable? If you don't go to work two or three times a month, are you a reliable, dependable worker? If your fridge stops working for a day or two every now and again, do you say, oh, well, it works most of the time? If your water heater provides an icy cold shower every now and again, is it dependable? And if you fail to worship God one or two Sundays a month, would you expect to be called a faithful, dependable Christian? We expect loyalty and reliability from things and other people. Isn't it reasonable then that God just might expect the same from us? Quite a powerful statement there. God expects us to be trustworthy and dependable. He wants us to be dependable in our relationship and our walk with him. And if we want to grow in Christ as followers of Jesus, we need to be dependable. And then the final thing this morning that I want to speak on is we need to be fervent. Growing followers of Christ will always be fervent in their walk with the Lord. Well, you've just got to look at the book of Acts and you see someone like Paul. Paul was fervent in his walk with the Lord. He was fervent in getting the message out to others. As soon as he's rested up in Antioch, he's off on the road again. He's, there's a fervency about him. And Apollos was fervent in his walk with the Lord. He had a desire to reach others for Christ. In verse 25, it says he was fervent in spirit. The word picture there is of boiling liquid, something that's fiery hot. He was fervent, Apollos. And then in verse 26, it speaks again about this fervency. It says he boldly spoke in the synagogues. And then in verse 28, it says he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing them from Scripture that Jesus is the Christ. This was a fervent man. He had a fervency in his heart. He wanted to get the message of Jesus out to all that he possibly could. How do we foster that fervency? Well, I believe it's when we see people the same way that Jesus sees them. You know, so often in our prayers, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of us pray for the compassion of the Holy Spirit, to have his heart towards the lost and towards others. That would set our hearts on fire if we saw people the way Jesus saw them. In Matthew 9, 36, we read, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. When we see people the way Jesus sees them, he sets our hearts on fire with his love and people's lives will be changed forever. 
Do you have that fervency for the lost? We need not only fervency in our relationship for God, but we need a fervency to reach the lost. We come back again to that main theme of the book of Acts. We are empowered to be witnesses, to share this great message that we have with those who have never heard. Do you have a passion burning in your heart to share the message of Jesus with the lost in this world? God wants us to have that fervency. And so as I close off this morning, I want to tell you that as followers of Jesus, he wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in our walk and our relationship with him. And the way we do that is we need to be available. Available for him to use. Available to serve him. We need to be teachable. Have a heart that is open and ready to receive. We need to be dependable, trustworthy, faithful, and we need to be fervent in our love for God, but fervent also in our passion for the lost. I end off with the words of the Apostle Peter that we read in 2 Peter 3.18. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord bless you. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He Happy Sunday morning, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome back to the Lord's Table. Today's passage, we see Paul and his companions continuing the mission faithfully, going from town to town, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. But I'm sure as it did to you, verse 27 stuck out to me. Admittedly, it might have been a passed over in an everyday reading plan, but I want to focus on today's verse. I want to meditate on it. I want to be appreciative of the power of verse 27. It's a verse pregnant with God's passion, His love, his kindness and his grace and mercy. He wanted to choose people of the nations. I'm not sure how many of you who are joining us are ethnically Jewish. We praise God for you, for you are indeed a part of the nation that God chose for himself. But we also know that verses like these show us the true theology is not all of Israel are ethnically Jewish. In fact, true Israel is comprised of the nations. This takes us right back to Genesis 22, when God made a covenant with Abraham saying that all nations would be blessed by his offspring. It takes us back to Acts 1, where our study began, when Jesus sent his disciples out into the world. We have to remind ourselves, when Jesus was on the earth, his ministry was for the people of ethnic Israel. You remember the story of the Seraphonician woman. He was seemingly reluctant, saying, I've come to gather the lost sheep of Israel. And yet after his death, burial, and resurrection, he sent his disciples out into the world. I'm reminded of the Pauline language that Paul uses in Romans 11, that we are grafted in. In fact, the truth is, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no free or slave, no man or woman. No, dear brothers, the truth is, it's just brother and sister, children of the one true God. Because he is the one true God. He is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is the God of Israel. But it's passages like these that remind us that Israel is not just a state. Israel is not just a land. Israel is not just an ethnicity. Israel is the people who recognize the Messiah is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We celebrate that. We are His people because what He has done for us. And that's what we're about to celebrate, what He has done for us. On the night that He was betrayed, He met with His disciples. He took bread. He broke it and gave thanks, saying, This is my body, given for you. Take and eat. In like manner, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. Take and drink. 
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your kindness. For verse 27, that a door of faith is open to the Gentiles. A door of faith is open to the nations. That we are those who believe in you, the one true God, the triune God, God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who recognize Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for covering and forgiving their sins. We are the true Israel. We thank you that that door of faith was opened up so many years ago. And we thank you that that door of faith is still open today. You are still calling people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. You are opening eyes and opening hearts as you have done for us that we recognize Jesus Christ, the Messiah. We recognize that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one true God. Help us to proclaim these things as Paul and his companions did so many years ago, counting the cost. We've seen the persecution they went through, and we know that it's possible we'll go through the same thing, if not worse. And yet, when we count the cost, we come to the conclusion that you are worthy of that cost. We thank you, Jesus. Help us to be faithful to this message, to this calling, to this gospel, today and until you return. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Have a wonderful week, Union Church. Be blessed. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. God will take care